Hi, and welcome to our visit to the gardens of Winston Churchill's Chartwell in summer. We are on the western edge of the county of Kent. Chartwell is located on the Weald and can be reached from junction 5 or 6 of the M25 and under 7 miles from Seven Oaks or Oxted railway stations. Today's visit will focus on the gardens. If you want to see inside the house, you can check out our early video captured in late September. I'll pop it up at the end. Actually, there is one part of the house which wasn't in the last video. Anyway, without further ado, let's explore these gardens. The walk from the ticket office leads you through well-maintained but quite natural planting. It's one of the things you come to expect from a property managed by the National Trust. There are paths leading off past the swimming pool to the woodlands which contain areas to keep the young ones occupied. We have a wonderful book, Gardens of the National Trust, and it features Chartwell on pages 74 and 75. It's here we learn that the water is fed by the seven springs of the Chartwell. Now that's interesting. If you'd like to take a look, I'll pop a link in the corner as well as in the description so you can check it out. It also covers some other National Trust sites we have visited, such as Scotney Castle and Sissinghurst. Those are led to the end too. I'll also include a link to the National Trust site, the map of the grounds and anything else I think you'll find of interest in the description. We have now reached the Great Orf Pond with Winston's seat. It's worth mentioning that Sir Winston Churchill was very much involved in the development of Chartwell. As was Clementine, or Lady Churchill, whose rose garden we will now be entering. This was the reason we had returned. Chartwell has a great selection of roses, many here, but many more on the Golden Rose Avenue, which we'll get to later. Although a rose garden, it is underpinned with planting in the style of an English country garden. So let's talk a little about the history of Chartwell House and its gardens. Sir Winston bought the estate in 1922 and set about having the house extensively rebuilt and remodelled. The aim was always to create a family home. He enlisted the assistance of society architect Philip Tilden. Work was completed in 1924 and the Churchills moved in in the spring of that year. It is then they set about the grounds and gardens and these were not the work of a moment. In fact work continued into the 50s and 60s. Clementine worked alongside Victor Vincent, who was head gardener from 1947 to 1979, to realise her dreams. With the National Trust retaining as much of the original feel of the estate as possible, with modernisation only when necessary. The National Trust took ownership in 1946, when it looked like Winston may have to sell Chartwell. The Churchills took out a 50-year lease to remain in their home but it passed back to the National Trust on the death of Winston in 1965, with Lady Churchill deciding to return to their London home. Chartwell opened to the public in 1966. We have now stumbled upon the Marlborough Pavilion. As you may know, Winston Churchill was descended from the Dukes of Marlborough, and he was born at the home of the family seat, Blenheim Palace. When you consider that, Chartwell is much more homely. One thing you'll notice about Chartwell is that it rises and falls. You'll see more of that as we explore. Chartwell commands some impressive views over the world of Kent. Sir Winston said, I bought Chartwell for that view. The plaque on the wall lists the names of those who saved Chartwell for the Churchills and the nation. It's certainly one of the National Trust's most popular properties. And there are plenty of places to sit back and soak it all in. noticed a part of the house we didn't cover in the last video. I suspect it wasn't open. There was a door in Lady Churchill's sitting room that led to this patio area. 
And one of the things that caught my eye was this wonderful table and chairs set. Of course, the views across the landscape are suitably impressive too, and you can also get a glimpse of St Winston Churchill's studio. We'll swing by there in a short while. We have some more to discover as we head along to the walled garden. Along the way, you're past the croquet lawn. Once again, there are plenty of places to take the weight off your feet and enjoy the peace and quiet. And those views. Should you want a little refreshment, at the end of the estate you have the Garden Cottage Cafe. There is another cafe at the entrance next to the shop and the ticket office. I think we're at the highest point on the estate, so it's downhill from here. I hope you are enjoying what we put together here. If you are then please give us a like. And if you find our style of video interesting then why not subscribe? We've plenty more travels planned. So let's descend and enjoy the walled garden. I should also point out, it's possible to buy a discounted ticket to just the gardens at Chartwell. You'll find the details on the National Trust website, for which there'll be a link in the description below. At the lower end of the walled garden, running through the centre is the Golden Rose Alley, but we're going to dart to the side where the planting is a little different. Here next to the rhubarb is a bed of nasturtiums planted with asparagus, both edibles, and that's given me an idea for our garden for next year. You'll find plenty of inspiration from visiting a National Trust site. Now let's take a look at Golden Rose Alley. What a beautiful sight. And you're going to have to take my word on this, but also a wonderful scent. And the bees love it. This was planted out in 1958 by Churchill's children as a gift for their parents on their golden wedding anniversary. It came into bloom the following year. Time, disease and pests were not kind to it so it was fully restored in 2016 with some of the varieties replaced, but still keeping to the theme of running from creamy yellow to delicate orange. The other side of the Golden Rose Alley find a few more surprises. There's the chicken run, and if you're lucky you might see one or two chickens scratching around in the dirt. Then there's the dovecot, just in front of Mary Cot. Winston Churchill built the little brick house with his own hands for his daughter Mary. Winston's skills as a bricklayer didn't end there. He laid by hand a sizable chunk of the southern end of the walled garden himself. In fact, there's a plaque attesting to that fact set in the wall. However, work was needed to make good this part of the wall, and that was featured in a BBC documentary, Hidden Treasures of the National Trust. I'll add that episode to the end of this video too. And time for a little tip. If you want to know a given plant that's taking your fancy, then make sure you install the PlantNet app on your phone. It's invaluable, or if you're old school and you've taken a picture on the camera, then use the web-based version. Now one last look around the walled garden before we head on. The next stop is the studio, and I know it's not part of the garden, but we'll just stick our nose in. At this point I want to call out the wonderful work the volunteers do in adding colour to the story of the National Trust properties we have visited. And Charles was no exception. My hat goes off to you ladies and gents. Now, as we head back to the house I want to mention places to stay if you plan to visit from afar. Well I'm going to suggest Westrop. I'll pop up a booking.com link to a recommendation we have for you. 
If you want to see more of Westrum, I'll pop a link in the corner at the end so you can check that out too. Plus there'll be a link of our Western road trip that stopped by Chartwell and explored the beautiful world of Kent. As you can see the skies have brightened so we'll take one last look at Chartwell's gardens and those stunning views. So as we call it a day on Chartwell, I would just like to thank you so much for watching. Stay safe, stay well and happy travels.